Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a moment. I'm just going to give folks a chance to join. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Ali Bell, and I will be your instructor for today's uh, Manhattan Prep LSAT Free Prep Hour. Uh, and we're going to dig in in just a moment. But first, I'd love to learn a little bit about who's joining us today. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd love for you to share your name, if it's not already listed, where you're joining us from, and what stage of your LSAT journey are you in? So for example, um, some of you might be prepping for the August administration of the LSAT. Others of you might just be starting out with your studying for a later test. Um, so I'd love to hear who's in the room. Take a moment to share in the chat. I'm gonna get the chat started by saying hello. Of course, Sal, this is my pleasure. All right, welcome Jake, taking the January LSAT. If you're just joining, we're just taking a moment to introduce ourselves in the chat. There are some prompts on the screen that you can use. Hi, Sophia, welcome from Hawaii. October LSAT, okay? Great, welcome from New York, Sal. Just getting started with the LSAT, awesome. Um, well, as these are, are trickling in, I will share a little bit about myself. Um, I've been an instructor with Manhattan Prep coming up on 11 years now. Uh, my background is in public school education, but I took the LSAT when I was a senior in college and got a 178 um, and have really enjoyed working with folks who really want to become lawyers uh, and helping them achieve their dreams. I think the LSAT is a really fun test and I really enjoy teaching it. Um, and I, in addition to being an LSAT instructor, am a GMAT instructor and also the training manager and an instructor manager um, for Manhattan Prep. So uh, today's LSAT free prep hour is gonna focus on logical reasoning and a particular question type within logical reasoning. Um, if you are exploring LSAT prep options, I wanted to share a couple of other free options that we have for you to be aware of. Um, one of my favorite things that we do at Manhattan Prep is offer trial sessions for our LSAT course. So you can sit in on the first class of our 10 session course um, for free, uh, no, you know, no payment required. Um, it's a three hour session and we cover the introduction to logical reasoning and logic games. So you can really get a lot out of that first class. Um, we also have a tool called LSAT Interact, and that is um, an asynchronous study option that is an interactive video series um, that teaches the curriculum of our course and also provides interactive practice with real LSAT problems. Um, so that's another thing that you're able to try a sample of for free, and you can check out both of those uh, through our, web our, our website. I see a couple more introductions rolling in. Welcome, Brandon from Massachusetts. Welcome, Kimora from New York. Um, so it looks like we've got a lot of folks planning for October or January LSATs in this group. That's great. So we've got a lot of time to study. So the question type that we're going to focus on today um, is called a matching question. And once you've been studying the LSAT long enough, if you're like many of my students, you'll have certain question types that you love 
and certain question types that you hate. I love matching questions, but I have come across many students who describe matching questions as the bane of their existence. And they'll tell me, if I see a matching question on the test, I'm just gonna skip it. And I can see why. I'll show you just a quick, you don't have to solve this right now, but just as an example, this is what a matching question looks like. It's long and it's complicated. It has one argument in the stimulus and then five separate arguments on five separate topics in the answer choices. So it takes a lot of time or it can take a lot of time to solve and it can feel really daunting. But there are some really cool tricks for solving matching questions that make them, I think, really fun. Um, and that's what I wanna share with you today. So before we do our first matching question, um, I wanna give you some strategies that we're gonna practice throughout this lesson. And these strategies are gonna be really helpful for this question type, but we'll also talk about some skills that are just generally super helpful in logical reasoning. So when we're dealing with a matching question, as we're gonna see in the examples that we work through today, what we're really thinking about is the structure of an argument. And one of the best things that we can do to work through these matching questions is to start by thinking about how we would break down the original argument itself. So typically when we're thinking about an argument on the LSAT, we're thinking about what is the premise of this argument and what is the conclusion? In other words, the conclusion is the point that the author of the argument is trying to make. And there's gonna be one or more pieces of support for that point. Um, and we often call those premises. Sometimes there will also be a little middle step in between the premise and the conclusion that we call an intermediate conclusion. And that's where we have a premise that provides support for sort of another premise that then provides support for a conclusion. So just to quick, give a quick example, um, I might say, for instance, um, my dog is friendly, therefore all dogs are friendly, therefore everyone should get a dog. So this is an example of, first of all, a very flawed argument, which you can definitely see on matching problems. So the arguments will not always be valid. Um, and it's an argument that has a premise followed by an intermediate conclusion that supports a final conclusion. So when I'm looking at an argument on a matching question, the first thing I do is I find the conclusion, I find the premise and or the intermediate conclusions, and I just kind of like mentally note them. So I've got a conclusion, I know how many premises there are, um, and then I start thinking about what is the nature of the premise and the conclusion. So conclusions, for example, might be a prediction. They might be a should or must or ought statement. Um, they might be a um, sort of softly worded statement or a strongly worded statement. So I'm gonna look at the language strength in a prediction, like um, all dogs are friendly or some dogs are friendly. Both of those could be a conclusion. Um, and they might be a statement of fact. They could be a choice, like an either or statement. Um, they could be a comparison. So it could be this is better or worse than something else. And premises can fit in a lot of these buckets too. Um, they might also include conditional logic. So there might be some if then statements or when then statements. Um, and the idea here is I wanna use some of these categories to describe the premises and the conclusions. And I wanna choose an answer choice that matches the way I described the premise and conclusion in the original argument. So if the premise had a comparison, I want the, the premise in my answer choice to have a comparison. If the conclusion was very strongly worded, I want the conclusion in my answer choice to be strongly worded. And on the flip side, I can also use mis mismatches with these categories to rule out answers. So for example, maybe there was no either or statement 
in this argument at all. And we have an answer choice with an either or a statement. There's a good bet that I might be able to cross that out. Um, maybe there is no conditional logic in this argument, but there's an answer with conditional logic. So they might be able to cross this out. So we're gonna get a lot of practice hands-on with what this actually looks like in a question. But I just wanted to give you a little preview of some of the things you might keep in mind as we work through questions today. We're gonna work through several questions from real LSAT practice test today. You'll see the practice test, um, the section and question number listed in the corner of the screen if you'd like to reference these later. For each question, I'm gonna give you about two minutes to solve the question on your own. That's pretty generous if you're working with standard time on your test. The amount of time you would want to devote to an LR question on your actual test day, if you have standard time, is a minute and 20 seconds. And of course, some people may have accommodations for extended time, which you would then adjust. So if you have double time, it'd be two minutes and 40 seconds, for instance. Um, but because we're learning today, I'm going to give you a little bit of extra time to work through the problem. And then after I give you that time, I'll launch a poll and I'll ask you all to weigh in on what you think the answer is. And then we'll discuss how we would go about solving that problem. I encourage you to use the chat or the Q&A um, throughout this session to let me know anything that you'd like for me to repeat or go over again, to ask specific questions, anything at all um, that you'd like to use to participate. All right, with that, let's take a look at our first matching question. I'll hop off the camera while you work through this. Um, and again, you can put your answer in the poll in two minutes. Here you All right, that is about two minutes. Thank you so much for the participation. You don't need to put your answers in the chat um, because we wanna let everybody have a chance to think this through on their own. So I'll always launch a poll, which will give you a chance to anonymously input your answer without influencing anyone. So here's the poll, go ahead and chime in. It did look like there was a consensus building in the chat and it also looks like there's some consensus building in the poll. All right, thanks to everyone who voted. Um, it looks like for those folks who did chime in um, that we are locked in on answer choice B. So I'd love to hear, um, and you could just tell me in the chat, what are some of the things, oh, no worries, no worries. I should have made that more clear. Um, what are some of the things that you saw in B 
that you felt were a match to the stimulus. So can you describe that for me in the chat? What were some of the things um, that you liked about answer choice B? Great, thanks Bianca, those are great points. I like that way of kind of breaking it down, Faye, with the emphasis on what you're looking for from each piece. Great, yeah, so I love, it sounds like a lot of you had a sense of what you were looking for uh, from these answer choices and, and are, you were focusing on the right things. So let's just um, go through this question together and I'll highlight the things that y'all were doing just right here. Um, so Bianca mentioned strong language indicating a quality in the premises. That's great. And I also love in particular that I see Bianca um, and Jake using the ideas of the premise and conclusion to break this argument down. So I always start by finding the conclusion. The conclusion here is that Rose's dogs were moderate barkers. And then we do have these super strongly worded premises. So we've got one premise that is all Labrador retrievers have this quality, then all St. Bernard's have this quality. And then we get this additional premise that's kind of combining um, the first two and saying, okay, so Rose's dogs are all a cross between these dogs with certain qualities. So um, Faye wrote in the chat, the first two premises are all and all. And that's a great a starting point for doing answer eliminations. So the way I typically approach these questions is rather than um, reading each answer entirely and making a full decision, I actually pick one quality of the original argument that I wanna focus on and I check each answer for that. So for this one, we've got two all statements that are describing a quality at first and they're in the premises. So I can kind of scan through each of these and check to see if they match in that way. So answer A, I see an all statement and then a some statement, and that's not a match. So I can get rid of that right away. Answer choice B does have that all and all statement. So does C, so does D, and so does E. So all I get out of that first one right away is an elimination of A. Then I see the second premise is that the um, there's something that is a mix of the qualities described in the first two statements. And one thing that I notice here in particular is that these are really two statements describing the same quality, but on a spectrum. So they're both about barking, but it's just like, is it a lot of barking or a little barking? So I'm looking now a little more closely at these premises. Do they describe the same quality on a spectrum? And do they say um, that there's something that's kind of a cross between each of these categories? So if I look at B, I see extremely toxic versus non-toxic. So that is the same quality on a spectrum. And I see this is supposed to be a mixture of these two categories, type A and type B. So that holds up, okay? When I look at C, when I look more closely, I see Green County versus Wynn County. That's not really a spectrum, which makes this a different kind of reasoning. So I'm gonna cross off C. And D has the same problem, shorthand versus calculus. Um, are that's not really two things on the same spectrum. They're two different um, things that you could know. Um, e does have this spectrum from very well made to very badly made. So I'll check, um, does it have this kind of mixture quality? Um, it says half of the dresses are well made and half of the dresses are badly made. So I notice that's a little bit different from the original argument because the original argument said, we've got a mix of this category and this category. 
Um, and so if we were to map that onto E, it should say we've got a mix of Kanisha's dresses and Connie's dresses. And instead this um, third premise is focused on the quality. So it's just mixing up the logic a little bit. Um, and that means that our answer is B. I do usually go back and double check that every part of the correct answer matches. So I'm looking for this kind of middle ground in the conclusion, and that's exactly what I get in answer choice B. All right, um, let me know in the chat if there are any questions on this one. Okay, let's take a look at another matching question. Again, I'll give you two minutes and you can wait for the poll uh, to let me know your answer. Here you go. All right, that's two minutes. I'm gonna launch a new poll. Let me know what you're thinking. And if you haven't had time to finish, just give me your best guess at this moment. All right, thanks. So once again, it looks like um, many of us are uh, in agreement about a particular answer. So let's check to see if we got this one right. Um, Kamora made a really great point in the chat, which was, wow, that's a lot to do in one minute. Um, and that's absolutely right. So when we practice matching questions, part of what we're trying to do is just get them right. But part of what we're trying to do is get them right faster. So even as you're getting questions correct in today's lesson, I encourage you to look for ways that you can move more quickly through this very dense question type. And one of the ways that you can look more quickly is use move more quickly is by using that strategy that we discussed of breaking the arguments to, into pieces, selecting one piece and looking for mismatches to that piece only. That really helps me get through these questions more efficiently. All right, so I'd love to hear in the chat, what were some of the things that you noticed in the stimulus that you were looking for in a correct answer? Tell me in the chat.
All right, so I see a comment on the structure of the conclusion and also resolution to a paradoxical situation. Both great points. Yeah, Jake, the, the conclusion is based on a contradiction. Both premises cannot exist. Awesome. I also noticed just really strong language in the conclusion, um, which might be something that I wanna look out for um, that could be an easier way to eliminate things. And I noticed that the conclusion is a negative statement saying there's these two things and you can't do both of them. So I'm looking for um, something where two things cannot both happen or cannot both be true. So that actually is where I would start um, because there's a really clear structure to that conclusion. I'm looking for two things that cannot both be true. So I'm gonna scan these arguments first, just with a focus on the conclusion. Now, oftentimes these answers will all follow a similar structure in terms of, you know, if the conclusion is last up here, it'll be last in the answer choices. It doesn't have to, so I do wanna keep an eye out for conclusion words and make sure that I'm kind of checking that it actually is the conclusion. So in answer choice A, I see so indicating the conclusion. I see that strong language and I see both. So we've got two things that cannot be true, looks good. Answer choice B, I see so since, since is a premise word, so I'm gonna skip ahead to see what these are reasons for. It follows that some politicians must deceive. That seems like a really different structure from saying two things cannot be true. Um, and it's also got much softer language and positive wording. So I'm gonna cross off B. Um, answer choice C similarly has a very different looking conclusion. Um, it doesn't have this concept of two different things that are in conflict that cannot both be true. So I'm gonna cross off C. Um, answer choice D looks a little closer. I see two things being addressed, but this is saying either A happened or B happened. Um, and our stimulus doesn't have a choice presented in the conclusion. It just says these two things can't both happen. So I'm gonna cross off D. And answer choice E says, so we will have to keep our business hours as they stand. Um, so this is a firm positive statement about what needs to happen. Again, very different structure from the conclusion. So I would eliminate E. So right now, the only answer I have in contention is A, but I do want to double check that it meets the rest of the criteria we were looking for. Maybe I overlooked something. So it says, it's claimed that we have this particular right to say what we want. We also have the obligation to be civil. So that kind of matches this idea that there are these two competing situations. Um, and then we get the contradiction right here. Civility requires that we don't do the first thing. We don't say what we want. Um, and then we get that follow-up conclusion that these two things cannot be both true. So answer choice A is a clear match and I'm gonna select it. One thing I wanna note here is just how powerful that move was of picking one piece of the argument, in this case, the conclusion, that allowed me to get rid of four answer choices without reading all of each answer choice. And that helps me move more quickly through this question. All right, let me know in the chat, what questions do you have about this problem or anything you'd like to hear more about? Okay, let's go ahead and try another one. Give you two minutes again.
All right, everybody, that's two minutes. I'm gonna launch another poll. All right, looks like this was a tougher question. I see a bigger split in the answers that we chose. Um, once again, I'd love to hear in the chat what you were focused on in the stimulus. So what did you notice about the structure of this argument? Um, calling out in particular that this argument is flawed. So you may have noticed some flaws in it. Um, but what did you see here that you were looking for in a correct answer? Tell me in the chat. Great, a group of people with an agenda counter to the speakers, that's important. We have a should statement and we have, um, here's what will happen if we don't do this. I love paying attention to the strength of the recommendation. Um, I would actually say that the recommendation isn't necessarily lightly worded um, because there's no ambiguity or uncertainty about it. It's just saying we should do this. Um, so that is probably more on the side of a firmly worded recommendation. Definitely the premises are based on an ad hominem attack um, focused on the bias or perspective of the people who oppose this. Yeah, good. All right, so um, I've got a few things to look for, starting with this should statement. And this is where this problem increases the difficulty, because unlike the last problem, if I identify this should statement as the conclusion, and I scan the answer choices for mismatches, I'm not going to find very many right away. Uh, I have a should statement, a should statement, a should statement, a should statement, and then a should not unless statement. This is different enough. The should not alone would raise a, a little question mark for me, but maybe wouldn't cause me to cross it out. But it's this unless part that I is going to make me get rid of E on the first pass, because um, unless is technically conditional logic. So it's saying like, if it's not absolutely necessary, you shouldn't borrow even small amounts of money. We don't have any of those sort of unless conditions attached to the conclusion in the original argument. So that would technically make this a mismatch. I'm gonna eliminate answer choice E based off of my conclusion. But again, we notice the higher difficulty because we only get one elimination this time instead of four from the conclusion. So next we might look to the premises and we know there's supposed to be some kind of opposition um, and that the opposition has an agenda that the author is critical of. So that's what I'm gonna check for next. Um, answer choice A, these might not be recognized as such by all taxpayers or even all critics. So I don't know if that really qualifies as opposition. This is telling me these people vehemently oppose this versus Maybe not everyone recognizes this. That doesn't really match in terms of language strength. So I'm gonna eliminate A. Answer choice B goes straight from the should statement to a reason. And we do have a reason in our original argument, but we also have this uh, commentary on the opposition and that's missing from B, so I'm gonna get rid of it. C has, uh, sort of a, a group of people, beauticians, and those people have an agenda and their agenda is counter to the author's point. So that looks good, I'm gonna keep it. Um, answer choice B is actually, it's a group of people opposed to construction, but those people align with the author's recommendation. Author's also recommending less postponed construction. So it's a little different from the argument where this group of people 
has an idea that runs counter to the author's perspective. So that leaves me with just C. Interestingly, I don't think C is a perfect match for this argument because it doesn't have much that um, matches this final statement. But this is one of the things that's kind of unique about matching questions that in particular ask you to match a flaw. So when I need to match a flaw, the most important thing that an answer choice needs to do is have the same flaw. In this case, the argument's flaw is it's assuming that because this idea is opposed by people who have an agenda, um, we should not accept that their, their thinking. We should not accept their line of thinking just because they have something to gain. And that's not valid because even when some people have something to gain from an idea, there might still be logical reasons to accept that idea. And answer choice C has that same flaw. So even though it doesn't match every aspect of the argument, when we're asked to match a flawed reasoning or a flawed set of reasoning, we wanna prioritize matching the flaw. And that's what C does. All right, this was a tough question. Is there anything that you'd like to hear more about An answer you wanna go over again or just general questions here? Put them in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bianca. Um, so Bianca asked, could I talk a little bit about the spectrum of language strength? Actually, absolutely. So there's this comes up a lot on the LSAT, so it's a, a really useful thing to think about. And in this particular problem, we are on the sort of should and ought spectrum. So should and ought statements are considered pretty strong um, because it's just saying like, this needs to happen and there's no qualification to it. If we wanted to weaken or lessen the language strength of a should or ought statement, uh, we might use a softer word like, I suggest that, or you know, may want to. Um, words that indicate like, I think this is probably a good idea, but I'm not gonna go so far as to say like, this should happen. Um, there's also a language strength spectrum in terms of like probability and likelihood that you'll see. Um, so for thinking about a prediction, um, we might have language strength that indicates that this is definite or certain um, versus in language strength that indicates like this is probably the case or even that this could be or might be the case. And we would wanna pay attention to that. Um, and finally, we can have language strength around quantity. So that of course goes from all to most, to some, to none. Um, and so that's something that you definitely wanna pay attention to. Um, I see a question from Deanna. So it sounds like for a flaw, you need to understand the stimulus, but for a matching, you really don't need to understand the stimulus. Great question. So um, that sort of like, pick it apart by the pieces and match it to the answer choices um, is more likely to be effective on just a straightforward matching question with no flaw. That's absolutely true. There will some, sometimes be situations where even on those questions, it helps to understand the stimulus because you might go through matching all the parts and still have a couple answers left. And then you need to think about the overall logical connection in the argument. So the pieces like the piece by piece matching is a good place to start and it can be useful on both types of questions um, but it is going to be more helpful on a flaw question to really understand the stimulus and a little bit less necessary on a straightforward matching question um, and yes say matching the flaw should be prioritized over the format although the format can often still be helpful particularly if you're not sure what the flaw is. So if you read a match the flaw question, you're like, I don't know what's wrong with this. Uh, then you can still try using the format and that you'll have some, you'll have a decent shot of illuminating some of the answers. All right, all great questions. Thank you for your engagement. Let's take a look at another problem. There you go.
Okay, that's two minutes and then I want to move it back. All right, thanks everybody. Um, please let me know again in the chat, what did you notice in the stimulus this time? share a couple of things that I noticed. Um, one is very strong language, as we were just talking about. So I see language like um, invariably and must, that's very strong. Yeah, Paul's pointing out the first and second arguments are connected. So we have this, okay, if you are a paleomycologist, you are definitely acquainted with scholarly publications, then we do get this connection. This professor is acquainted with the scholarly publications of a paleomycologist. So we see a lot of overlap of terms and connections. And that's often a sign that we're dealing with what we call conditional logic, which I'll get more into in just a second. So that's a great thing to notice. The conclusion is based on one person or example. Yeah, that's a great point, Deanna. So we get this one sort of very specific connection to a very broad statement. Um, and then we make a conclusion about something much more specific. So it goes from a very broad statement to a pretty specific conclusion. Um, and assuming that something is classified a certain way because of a single quality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these are all great things for us to pay attention to as we're looking through the answer choices. Um, I want to dig into this idea of conditional logic a little bit before we look at the answers, because there's something important going on here. So if I were to kind of map out this logic in the form of if-then statements, the way that we do when we're using what's called conditional logic, it would look like this. I'd say, okay, so I know from the first sentence that if you're a paleomycologist, I'm gonna write that as PM, then you are acquainted with the scholarly publications of all other paleomycologists. So I'm gonna put SP and that's my stand in for you're acquainted with all of their publications. Um, then I get this fact that Professor Mansoor is acquainted with one paleomycologist, so one um, scholarly set of scholarly publications. Therefore, Professor Mansour is definitely a paleomycologist. We've got several flaws going on here. And one of them is what was called out, which is we're going, we're basing this off of one very specific um, example, rather than all paleomycologists, right? So we don't know that Professor Mansour is acquainted with all paleomycologists, just this one person. So that's a flaw in the argument. The argument is also reversing its logic. It's saying, if you're a paleomycologist, that means you'll be acquainted with all these publications. It doesn't necessarily work the other way. So that doesn't mean that if you're acquainted with all these publications, you are a paleomycologist. Um, it's possible that you could have a different reason for wanting to study paleomycology in extreme detail. So um, I'm looking for both of those flaws to show up in the correct answer. And I could start by looking for either one. So when I scan through the answers, um, I do notice a lot of really strong language, any, any, all, whenever. So I've got to dig a little bit deeper to see if I see this particular pattern that we're looking for. So I'll start with answer choice A. And I'm just going to focus on the first two premises and see if we have a match for the pattern I see in those premises. 
um, where we start kind of reversing the logic and we start focusing on one specific example. So A starts with a very general conditional relationship. When it's delayed, all the connecting flights are delayed. And then it does move to one specific example. Um, so I like that, I'm gonna keep it. The next one um, goes from any time you miss a shift, everyone else needs to work harder than usual. Then it is none of the agents missed a shift last week. So it's not moving to a very specific individual instance. So I'm gonna cross off B. Answer choice C has the same problem. Um, anytime the price of fuel decreases, moving to, it decreased several times last year. It's not a single specific example. So I'm gonna cross it off. Um, answer choice D, all employees can participate. So that is technically conditional logic. It's saying if you're an employee, you can participate after you've been with the company for more than a year. And it does move to a specific example of Gavin. So I'm gonna keep it. Um, and then answer choice E has the conditional logic, but it has kind of a choice. And that is not part of my original conditional logic. I don't have a either this or that. It's just this one thing is true. So I'm gonna cross off E. So just that initial analysis leaves me with answer choice A or D that I wanna consider. So now I'm gonna look at the back half of the logic and I'm gonna see if I have this logical reversal going on. So answer choice A, my initial flow of logic is if one flight is delayed, then all connecting flights are delayed. And then we get Frida's connecting flight is delayed. So her first flight must have been delayed. This looks really promising. We've got a logical reversal. And we're also going from a broad statement about all flights to this is just true about her first individual flight. So it seems to match the flaws. Check out answer choice D. So all employees can participate after they've been with the company for a year or more. Gavin has been with Global Airlines for three years. We can therefore be sure that he participates in Global's retirement plan. Also looks really promising. We've got a reversal of logic um, that he's been there long enough to participate. Therefore, he definitely participates. So one of these answers is more correct than the other. And I'd love to hear in the chat, um, what do you see as a problem with either answer choice A or answer choice D? Why is one of these better than the other? Ooh, okay, so Deanna is calling out A uses must and D doesn't. That's a good point. The actual word doesn't have to match as long as the strength of the idea matches. So we do have a fairly similar language strength in that it says we can be sure. So there, there's no question about it. So I don't know if I could eliminate based off of that. Um, I see language of guarantee on D makes it incorrect. So yeah, so I'm curious to hear more about that. Like, what are you seeing as a guarantee? I'll dig into it a little bit while you all share more elaboration on your thoughts in the chat. One thing that I noticed about answer choice D is that it starts with, if you're an employee, you can participate, not that you have to, versus paleomycologists definitely have to be acquainted with scholarly publications. And that leaves room for it to make sense that Gavin, you know, even though he meets the criteria, he could opt out. So that's a little bit of a different line of thinking than what we've got in the original uh, stimulus here, which is the reason that I would eliminate it because it has that. It's possible for you to participate, but it doesn't create a relationship where if you are an employee, you definitely participate in the retirement plan. Yeah, exactly, Kamara. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, well said. Um, Sal says A is most closely similar to the contradictions presented. 
A makes the same false assumption, most identically. Yeah, good. D is based on choice. Well, Deanna, D is diagrammable, but it's just that the um, right side of the condition is has a different language strength, right? So what I know if you are an employee is that it's definitely true that you can, like you're eligible to participate. And that is conditional logic, right? You're 100% guaranteed to be eligible to participate. But it means I don't know as much about you if you're an employee as I do if you're a paleomycologist, because that doesn't say like, it's pot, if you're a paleomycologist, it's possible that you could be acquainted. It says you are acquainted. And so I have more information about you as a paleomycologist than I do if you're an employee. All right, lots of great questions and commentary there. Yeah, I can explain the reverse logic. So the idea of reverse logic is, um, it's when you take a statement that is like, if A, then B, and then you follow a flow of logic that really suggests what you're trying to say is, if B is true, then A is true. So this argument starts out by saying, if you're a paleomycologist, then you're acquainted with scholarly publications. It does not say that if you're acquainted with these scholarly publications, you're necessarily a paleomycologist. That's an example of reverse logic. So the rest of the argument, though, then goes on to say, Professor Munser is acquainted with scholarly publications. So it starts over here. And then it says, so Professor Munser must be a paleomycologist. So it's following the logic backwards, saying this is our starting point for knowing it's true that you're a paleomycologist, when all that the original statement supports is the opposite. If you're a paleomycologist, then you're acquainted with scholarly publications. Yeah, so the idea of sufficient and necessary is another way of describing reversed logic. Um, we call this left side of a conditional statement the sufficient side or the sufficient part of the conditional logic, meaning that it's enough to guarantee something. And the right side is the necessary piece of the conditional logic, meaning it has to happen. And so when we have reverse logic, another way of expressing that is to say we've confused the sufficient with the necessary. Exactly, that's a great connection. Okay, great job with that, everybody. Um, let's do one more problem. This will be our last one, two minutes here.
All right, class, two minutes, and then we'll launch our final poll of the day. All right, looks like we've got another tough one here. We're quite divided on our answers. So let's review. Um, the first thing that I noticed here is that this is a conclusion um, that's kind of got a pivot structure to it. So um, we have an initial statement that's like, here's one way you might think about this, but that would be misleading. And I also noticed the strength of this conclusion. So this isn't a particularly strong statement. When I say it's misleading, that doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% wrong. It just means it's kind of incomplete or not fully accurate in some way. So I'm gonna start with that conclusion. Um, there was a question in the chat um, from Paul. Can you just go straight to the conclusion and see if you can eliminate the wrong answer? Yeah, and this is a great question for us to try that out on. So I'm gonna start by seeing if the conclusions match in terms of their strength and whether they're positive or negative. So answer choice A is super strong, can never be accurate. It's actually leading into the future, which this conclusion doesn't do, and it's much stronger than our conclusion. So I'm gonna cross it off. Um, answer choice B could hardly be improved. That's a very positive assessment of how we think about something. It's, we basically are, it's, are almost perfectly thinking about it, which is the opposite tone of this conclusion. So I'm gonna cross it off. Um, future generations understanding will be distorted. That sounds really similar to this would be a misleading impression. So I'm gonna hold on to that. So does our understanding is incomplete. So I'm gonna keep that. Our notion of fast and trends will probably be accurate. Um, again, is an opposite tone. This is saying it's, it's gonna be somewhat inaccurate. So I'm gonna cross off B. So then I'm down to answer choice C and D. So I wanna think a little bit about what support I've been given, which is basically the music videos in the seventies only attracted a certain type of musician. Um, and so they're not, they're a small sample, not reflective of all musicians. So I'm looking for something related to this being a small sample size. Um, so answer choice C says, mostly people who publish computer games are using a CD-ROM. That does sound like a small sample size. Um, answer choice D though, is focused on something a little different. Basically that um, these films disintegrated over time and people didn't realize that would happen. That's not really related to sample size. So I'm gonna cross off D and the correct answer here is C. All right, that's where we're gonna wrap up today. Um, Again, you can learn more about additional prep options, including our upcoming classes on our website. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Good luck with your LSAT studying uh, and take care. Bye everybody.